Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Again, my name's uh, Chris. I'm an alcoholic. It's... um it's really great. We're, tonight we have uh, we have Larry G from Staten Island. He's going to be uh, giving a talk on uh, first year sponsorship men. Next week, uh, Mendy is going to be uh, Mendy F is going to be giving a talk on first year sponsorship women. Now, uh, if anybody that was up at the Wilson House uh, in March, uh, uh, Larry and Mindy both gave these uh, these same talks up there, and they were really the highlight of of the weekend. Um, uh, Joe H from uh, Santa Monica had uh, had asked me to uh, to get Larry involved in this because he thought uh, that Larry would be uh, would be a great addition to uh, to the type of uh, workshop that we were doing last March. And uh, I didn't know Larry all that well at that time. Uh, uh, I've since come to know him very much, uh, uh, very much better, and uh, it's it was such a powerful talk. Um, I'm really, really pleased that uh, that he came uh, for all the way over from Staten Island to uh, to join us tonight. And I'd like to introduce my friend Larry. Come on up, Larry. Hi, everybody. My name's Larry. I'm an alcohol. Is this an open meeting? Yeah. I'll take that back. My name's Larry. I'm an alcoholic. There was a time when I went to meetings. I certainly did not want to say my last name. And then I read a book called Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. And it explicitly and clearly told me that not using my last name at a closed meeting, especially my home group, was as much breaking the traditions as going on radio, press, and TV. So I'm used to saying my last name, and I apologize for using it here. At an open meeting, it shouldn't be given. But since this is first-year sponsorship, everyone I sponsor, when they go to closed meetings, they give their first and their last name. I used to be called Tattoo Larry. And can you imagine somebody looking for me, an alcoholic who may need help or a little fellowship, calling up the operator and saying, can I please have the phone number of Tattoo Larry? They wouldn't get too far. Anyway, my sobriety date is September this month, 1988. I'm not too sure of the day. Uh, My home group is the Common Solution Group on Staten Island. It's one of the sickest groups I've seen. Nobody has an individual program. Everybody works the exact same program as recovery as outlined in our textbook, the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the first 164 pages. There's nothing individual about it. Well, when Chris said this was sponsorship of men, I don't know how to do that. You see, I just started sponsoring two more people within the last week and a half. And they're both women. And probably now, over 60% of the people I sponsor are women. And I love to talk about the circle. And this was just given to me with the young lady in the back. I love to talk about the circle around our triangle. As the circle, meaning as one. All-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding. Am I to turn away somebody who needs help because they're a woman? Why don't I turn away a black? Why don't I turn away an Arab? Is the realm of the spirit really all-inclusive? Can I really take that leap of faith to believe that God will do for them and for me what I can't do for myself? I'd like to thank my wife, Joanne, for coming. She's a big part of sponsorship. She gives the love and tenderness and nurturing that I seem to lack. 
You know, I don't know much about a big book study. I know about a big book do it. You know, I'm from Brooklyn. I've been scarred by uneducation. I'm not very well educated. Growing up in Brooklyn, I thought Moby Dick was a venereal disease. I, I like to keep things real simplistic. I love humor in, in sobriety. It tells me we're not a glum lot. And I think that's important, working with a new friend, to have humor. And talking about a little humor, I was asked, uh, I did a little story on Chrissy, and I was asked if I would do it again. And there was a story that probably most of you don't know when Chris was uh, about eight years old and he was in school. And the teacher was uh, doing a science lesson. And she took a glass of scotch and a glass of water. And she took this worm and she put the worm in the water. And the worm swam up and it swam down and it swam up and it swam down. And then she took the worm out and she put the worm in the glass of scotch. And the worm swam up and sank to the bottom and lay there dead. And the teacher said, class, what does this lesson teach us? And Chris's hand went right up. Ooh, ooh, me, teacher. And she said, yes, Chrissy. And Chris said, it's very simplistic. If you drink scotch, you'll never have worms. <laughs> now, you may think that has not too much to do with sponsorship, but I got to tell you the truth. It has everything to do with sponsorship. Because I got to sit down with someone who thinks like that. I don't know how to think normally where alcohol is concerned. I, I think it's real important. Before I work with someone, for me to answer some basic questions that we always ask the newcomer. And we're talking about that person who just walks into in the rooms, someone who's new. And the question Larry has to ask Larry is, am I willing to go to any length for their victory over alcohol? Or am I just going to give them a little bit of time? Am I going to make their recovery the most important thing in my life? If the answer is not yes, I better walk away and give them to another alcoholic who will devote the proper time to them that they should have. I was just talking, and I just can't seem to get it out of my head about women. And we have that circle, because there's so many women here. And if I would have believed that lie, men with men, women with women, I would have been cheated out of the great gifts that you women had to teach me. The love, the compassion, the gentleness. I would have lost it. I, I wouldn't have had it. Can I really, really take the leap of faith that we're all one, that there is no difference? It just seems important to me. I remember trying to get sober, and I had relapsed for some 15 or 20 times. And people walked away from me. They ran away from me. They said, Larry, you don't want it bad enough. Some guys had the mendacity to tell me I was full of shit. And I promise you, I did not want to drink. I hurt. I hurt so bad, and I couldn't stop drinking. I didn't want the pain, the misery, the isolation, the degradation. But I couldn't stop. And there was no one in my area who knew anything about the program of recovery, as you guys have out here. One program that will work for every alcoholic if we choose to work it. I remember I had my first lesson with my sponsor that I pass on to others. After my 15th or my 20th relapse, and I have no idea, I lost count and so did everybody else. I could sell chips. I had so many new chips. I, I remember my sponsor telling me to go to the door. And stick your hand out and say, hi, my name is Larry, welcome. And I said, I can't do that. He said, no, you won't do that. I said, no, I can't do that. And he took me as a little 42-year-old child I was. With my head hung down, looking at the floor, I couldn't look at any of you people in the eyes. 
and he stood at the door, a tower of a man. He said, Hi, welcome, my name is Bo. Hi, welcome, my name is Bo. And after about ten minutes, I kind of got the idea. And I went to the door with my head looking on the floor, and I said, Hi, my name's Larry, welcome. Hi, my name's Larry, welcome. And my sponsor had me do that at every meeting I went to. A week later, people walked in. They said, hi, Larry, you're looking good. And I learned a very important lesson, that I had to stick my hand out. People are just not going to come up to me. i got to let them know I need help. It's a very important lesson for one to learn in Alcoholics Anonymous. I also found out that sponsors lie. My sponsor heard me tell someone make 90 meetings in 90 days. He said, Larry, come to my house. We have to talk. I went to, I was on my way to his house. I was so proud. He's finally going to listen to what I have to say. We sat down. I started to talk. He said, shut the hell up. He offended my sensitive alcoholic feelings. I said, I thought we're here to talk. He said, no, you're here to listen. And I figured out that you guys talk a different language, and I don't know nothing about it. And he said, I heard you tell someone to make 90 meetings in 90 days. I said, yeah. He said, why would you possibly tell someone to do something? They do not have the power to control or the choice to do. He said, why don't you get off your lazy alcohol gas and take them to 90 meetings in 90 days? And another lesson was forged in me. The lesson of... Don't give advice to people in Alcoholics Anonymous unless you're ready to stick your hand out and walk the walk with them. It's too damn easy to tell someone what to do and walk the heck away from them and let them flounder. I was sober a long time, probably about three and a half weeks, and my ex-wife told me she wanted a divorce. I was devastated. I was broken. I was at meetings crying, sharing my dramas of life. And an old-timer came up to me, and he said, Larry, let go. And I said, how do I let go? And he said, turn it over. I said, how do I turn it over? He said, let go. I said, how do I let go? He said, turn it over. And I promise you, I wanted to turn him over to his God as soon as I could get my alcoholic hands around his throat. I wanted to murder him. You see, but he only gave me what he knew. The truth is, he had no idea how to let go and turn it over. You see, we learn that in the program of recovery. We do steps four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is exactly and precisely how we let go and we turn it over. But I better make darn sure I have a solid one, two, and three before I start. I'm here to share with you a lot of experiences that I had. Uh, my greatest experience, and I love to share it because I love controversy. As you could tell, I started with the men and women. You know, can you imagine me, here I go again, going over to Mother Teresa saying, I need help. She says, I'm sorry, I can't comfort you because you're a man. I doubt if she'd do that. I truly doubt it. I wonder if any of the great spiritual leaders would turn me away because I'm a man or a woman. But I was sponsoring this young boy. He was sober another long time, about 11 weeks. And he came up to me and he said, Larry, Larry, I met this girl and she is absolutely wonderful and she was fabulous. And I said, yes. He says, you don't really understand. And I just listened. I said, yes. He says, I really want to take this girl out. And I said, yeah. And he says, but you're going to tell me no relationships with the first year. I said, go ahead. He says, but I really want to take her out. And finally, after this went on and on and on, I said, Michael, do you have a question you'd like to ask me? And he said, yes. He said, I met this girl. She's a darling. She's not one of us. And I want to take her out. And I said, could you keep your sobriety the most important thing? He said, yes, I can. I said, well, you take her out and you have a great time. Can you imagine me playing God that somebody, God, puts two people together and the great Larry should tell them you don't belong together? I have to live a third step. I got to live it. 
I don't know what the hell he should do. I'm there to support him and trust God. Well, I'd like to tell you that he celebrated over ten and a half years sobriety. He now just had his third child, and he swears to me he's working on number four. And they're happy and they're joyous and free. You see, I don't know what's right, and I don't know what's wrong. But I have spiritual tools that I must live by. I have come to believe that the word never really means never. That the alcoholic has a rough time, and I did with that word never. I was puzzled whether I didn't understand the ne or the ver. But never is still never. I have to never give any of any solution other than a middle of the road solution. That's, I'm sorry. I cannot give a solution that's a middle of the road solution. I must give a solution how to have a deep and effective spiritual experience. Now, a lot of people would say to me, Larry, you shouldn't have said that about relationships. This program is all about relationships. First, first with a power greater than myself, and then with all his God's kids, my brothers and sisters. And so this young boy had a spiritual experience with about three weeks over. God came to him, just like he did to Bill. You see, I can't have contempt prior to investigation. There are no hard rules. I have to lay aside everything that I think I know. I have to lose my attachment in sponsoring people to what's good, what's bad, what's right, or what's wrong. There was a time I knew what type of sobriety they should have. I knew where they should be spiritually. I don't know where they should be. Everyone's spiritual experience is different. None of us have the exact same one. And it's my job just to walk with you. I think it's important in the beginning. Because I was given this prayer. And since I started saying this prayer, and it was given to me in a rough, crude way, but the prayer went exactly, God, please take away the obsession, the compulsion, the thought and desire for me to drink today. And every time I wanted a drink or I thought of a drink, to go right to the power. My sponsor started pointing me to the power. He said, don't you dare call me or go to a meeting. You go to the power first. Then call me. Well, bless his soul. Thank God for him. He knew he wasn't God. He knew it's only the grace of God that keeps me sober. Do I really believe that anything else will keep me sober other than the grace of God? Than anything else I'm giving other than how to have a deep and effective spiritual experience just won't cut it. I love to ask questions when I'm asked to be someone's sponsor. And one of the questions is, are you willing to go to any length? And I found out from experience that my willing to go to any length and someone else's willing to go to any length are different. So I ask another question. Are you willing to do anything? Now, alcoholics have a rough time with words. I really know it. I'm one of you. But anything is anything. If they give me anything they're not willing to do, I thank them and ask them to seek somebody else. I can't help them. I also like to ask them, are they willing to make their sobriety the most important thing? Are they willing to put nothing in front of their sobriety? If they answer yes, I like them to write those questions down in the front of the book, date it, and then initial it, to make a deal with themselves. And I got that in the last workshop. I'd like to tell you it's mine. I've been doing it all along. I only started doing it since the last seminar. I heard somebody share it. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. The only rotten thing about it is I didn't think of it. If I would have thought of it, it would have been terrific. I asked them to read with a highlighter the first 164 pages of our basic textbook. I asked them to highlight everything they think is important. When they finished that, 
I ask them once again, are you willing to go to any lengths, do anything? If the answer is yes, we start the intensive work quickly, promptly, vigorously, strenuously. You see, those words in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, are just not there for me to teach. They got to be there for me to live. I have to be able to carry those spiritual principles into all my activities. I've got to be an example. Uh, I, I, I was called up yesterday, and a lot of people won't agree with what I'm going to say, and, and it's quite all right. And I was asked if I would speak uh, out here in Jersey at a Thursday meeting. And I had to decline because Thursday night's my home group. And that's the important group for me. That's where I go on Thursdays. I made a commitment to that home group. And no group is more important than my own group. So I had a decline. Those I sponsor, unfortunately, they have to decline. You see, we're just products of sponsorship. That's all we are. I was talking with an old-timer uh, two Saturdays ago, and he was wondering where sponsorship went. Someone comes into a meeting, we turn the meeting over to the newcomer. In my home group, you need a year of sobriety to take a commitment. We do not turn the meeting over to the sickest. The meeting is more important than any individual. This is where someone will walk in to find recovery. And it better be right. I've never told anybody that I would sponsor them. I told them I'll be their temporary sponsor. And when they're finished with me, I pray that they move on to somebody else who could give them more. Because here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we do not take prisoners and hostages. All we wish is for their recovery. And it's step 10, to keep growing in understanding and effectiveness. And when they find their next teacher, we beg of them to please move on. They've helped us more than we've helped them. I really like as we go through the book, to overemphasize things. I, I think it's very important as we go through the first step that they can see to their innermost self that they were alcoholic. You see, I came to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and said I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know why the heck I was an alcoholic. I think they have to examine, they have to abundantly confirm that once they start drinking, they cannot control the amount they take because they suffer from an allergy. And their allergy manifests, they manifest, what's that word? Manifest in a craving, just like the person who's allergic to iodine, their throat closes up, strawberries, they get a rash. My abnormal reaction, my allergy, is I get a craving for more. They've got to have it. I've seen too many people in Alcoholics Anonymous that don't have a craving. They can control the amount of liquor they take. I wonder what the hell they're doing here. If I could control the amount they take, I certainly wouldn't be here. Do they have the sick, insane, alcoholic mind? Have they conceded that they're like the jaywalker? Have they conceded that they have no mental defense against the first drink? These are all extremely important considerations. I've never seen a real alcoholic going through the first few chapters whose head isn't going up and down. I've seen many who aren't alcoholics be puzzled. They just can't identify. You know, we talk about normal is on the washing machine, and that's the only, any, the only normal thing. My sister is normal. If you convince my sister a particular act will cause her pain, misery, isolation, degradation, loss of fa friends, family. She will not do it. She has does not have a sick, insane mind to try to get her back to it. I've taken enough people through the first step, and those that I've worked with, I've never seen one surrender. I've seen that come in step three, when they surrender to a power greater than booze. I've never seen a Surrender in step one. It's a concession. I concede what I am. That's all it is. 
when we went up to the Wilson house, I heard them read from Sister Ignatius' writing. And I just got a real deep feeling in my heart when she says what an honor it was to watch them with three or four days make their surrender, get down on their knees and do their third step. Surrender to a power that's greater than booze. I love the second step. I think it's real important for the Evenments on page 52. And I've never seen a new alcoholic that doesn't have every single one of them. And I love to ask them to fix themselves. I like them. I need them to experience that lack of power is their dilemma. That they don't have a power by which they can fix themselves. If they have the power, why the hell would they seek a power? They have to be absolutely convinced. And I believe that if we turn every statement into a question and walk with them hand in hand and allow them to see their own truth, they'll see their truth. I think it's important about the first requirement. To be convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. Because sometime later, you know they're going to start running the show. You know darn well it's going to happen. We've all done it. And it's good to bring it back. I love to spend time on the first requirement. I love to spend time that there are requirements and there are rules. The first step told me I was going to have to do things I was not going to like. Can you imagine telling that to an alcoholic? You're going to have to do things you're not going to want to do and you're not going to like. If you get them when they're hurting, I guarantee you, they'll do anything. Once they're in here a while and they're feeling better and the wrinkles are out of the belly is another story. I love that new guy. I remember walking into a meeting with my wife and I saw the school teacher. And she weighed all of about 85 pounds, and her face was scratching and bleeding, and she stunk of urine. She was disgusting, and no one wanted to go over to her. And I told my wife, honey, I love her. I love that woman, because she's just like me. I love her with every fiber of my existence, and there's nothing I wouldn't do to help her. And I think that's the attitude that Larry has to take. I have to take it now. I told you before, I recently started to sponsor two new women. One had been sober 14 years. And she drank uh, about a week and a half ago. I guess no one spent enough time going through the program of recovery with her because she hadn't. And she had no idea about the first requirement. My life run on my will can hardly be a success. We haven't even started the work. She's sure of it now. She's absolutely sure that she can't run the show. I've never seen such willingness. But I didn't want to work with her because she's disabled and she doesn't have a car and she's going to be a big inconvenience to me. I don't want to give of my time to help an alcoholic. I don't want to give away freely what was so freely given to me. Because she only calls me up six or eight times a day. And you know women have issues. And you know they have feelings. And here I am on the phone talking to my sponsor. And out of my mouth comes, can you believe my selfishness? I don't want to give away what was so freely given to me. And I do some dumb stuff, like I ask God for the right thought and action. And of course I called her back and I told her I loved her. And I would do anything for her sobriety, as long as she's willing to do anything. And so our journey's beginning. She's up to page 100 in the book, and that's after three days. And she doesn't leave very fast. Surprised she's not done with it by now. 
And I promise you, if this went two weeks and she told me she's finished, I'd ask her to get another color highlighter and read it again. Because I really take the words in our text seriously. I really believe strenuous is strenuous. Vigorous is vigorous. Wholeheartedly with all my heart. I believe in these sacred spiritual words. I've also found there's a lot of spiritual virtue in following directions. I think it's important that if the person chooses, we do step three on our knees, as long as it's not against their religious beliefs. I've had some fabulous, fabulous experiences. I also love after the third step, and I've got to point it out. And i got to point out every single word, and every single line has to be turned into a question to ask if they identify. Though this decision, step three, was vital and crucial, and I point out those vital, like breath, crucial, it will have little permanent effect. Step three will not last. Unless at once, now, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things that were blocking us. Things that were blocking us that we conceded that we need to live. Things that were blocking us from the power. We have to face step four and be rid of five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's my job to show them in black and white how what they hear a lot of things in the fellowship is not, never will be, and I doubt if it ever was true. I've heard one step a year. They just told me to do steps four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, vigorously, strenuously now. They asked me not to wait, and i got to tell you the truth. We take out a yellow pad just like this, after three, and we start. And we make a list of all persons they have resentment against. And they probably don't have too many. And if you ask them who the hell were you ever pissed off at, they got a whole book, a whole book full of it. They seem to really understand an alcoholic who I've been pissed at. And I start simply with family, mother, father, children, wives, going to friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, aunts, uncles, down the list. And we go back, and we go back, and we go back. You see, recovery doesn't come until steps 10 and 11. So why the hell would I keep them in step 4 forever? Am I going to make step 4 an intellectual exercise, or is it really a spiritual exercise? Can I ask them to do the most important thing, writing inventory? God, please show me what I need to see that blocks me from you and my fellow man. And trust God. Not Larry will show them. I don't know what they should see. They're not going to see what I see. I'm not going to see what you see. Let them do their second column. Why was I pissed? Show them the seven areas, how it affected me. Go into the fourth column. We were just talking before the meeting. I promise you, we're not doing theater of the lie. And we're not doing an extended third column. And we ain't doing any of that other bullshit. This is a new person who's dying. You want me to keep him in the sickness? Or you want to move him on to 10 and 11, where he gets you covered? They talk about intensive work. Intensive. Life-saving. This is a life-saving process. This guy, this girl, they're going to die. They don't need to learn nothing. They need to experience. They need to start trusting God. I promise you if, they, if they've asked God to show me what I need to see, it's going to be a perfect inventory. Unless I start playing God and I decide what they should see or what they shouldn't see. Now, I do sit down with them and I do show them how to write and how to write until the flow comes to them. In the fourth column, I don't like to do four. I like to do five areas. 
Uh, I think it's important to see where I was at fault, where I started the ball rolling. I think it's probably the most powerful experience I've ever seen. I do just what the book says about four, and I don't want to get into any debates with the new person. We make a list, we talk about self-reliance, and we see what we have to see. And we move on. We keep moving. One step opens the door to the next. We do sex. We write a sex idea. We do step five. We do step six. We do step seven. Step eight, there's usually a little bit of trouble. Because there's always some people that I don't want to make an amends to. And we go back. We go back to the first requirement. We go back to the third step about me running the show. Am I really willing to take the leap of faith that God will do for me what I can't do for myself as long as I stay close to him and perform his work well? Or am I going to start to run the show again, decide what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do? I don't know about those I'm willing to make amends to, those I'm not willing to make amends to, those maybe I'm willing to make amends to, those I'll never make amends to. I think it says all, and I think they mean all. We get down on our knees, and we ask God to please help us be willing to make amends to Mommy, to Daddy, to Mary. If they're not willing, I have them skip it and go on. And then I just have them stay on their knees on a nice hardwood floor like this. Yeah. I've never seen anyone last over 35 minutes. They become very willing, and I have no idea. I just have them ask God. I believe step nine. I believe there's an approach to be made. I believe it should go something like, Mary, this is Larry. I'm calling you because I'm in a program of recovery. As part of this, part of a program of recovery over alcoholism. Part of the program is that I make a list of people I have harmed and try to fix the wrongs I've done. As I've made this list, your name has appeared. If it's okay with you and at your convenience, I would love to sit down face to face and talk about the wrongs I've done. Give all the instructions. There's that word never. We never talk about them. We only talk about us. I think it's important when they're making the amends that they ask, is there any is there any other way I've harmed you that I haven't seen? You know, I think as I stole a hundred dollars from Mark, that I just stole a hundred dollars from Mark. And when I asked Mark, are there any other ways I've harmed you? Mark says, Yeah. That was my child's birthday money. And because of a thieving bastard like you. My child had to go without a present on his birthday. And I see the harms that I've done. You see, I don't know how I've harmed them. I don't know nothing. I just ask. And then I ask the final question. What can I do to fix the wrongs? And I go there willing to do anything. I'll do anything to fix these wrongs. I've seen these are the thing that stands between me and my creator. And all I want to do is walk hand in hand with my creator. I don't want to do nothing else. You know, I like to go back to the bottom of page 13, around the ninth step. And on the bottom of page 13, it says something like, When these things were done, we would enter into a new relationship with our creator. We would have a way of living that answered all our problems. When these things were done, what am I willing to do to walk hand in hand with my creator? Am I willing to do it all? I love to show them in step 10 how we cleaned up the past. It's like spilling a glass of milk on the floor. And if I clean up 90% of it, I ain't cleaned up the milk. I cleaned up the milk. When all the milk is cleaned up, cleaned up the past, finished amends, finished every single amends that God has disclosed to me. 
I love to point out that we should grow in understanding and effectiveness, that we just do not go through the program of recovery and stop. We have to keep growing in understanding and effectiveness, and this should last for our lifetime. Am I willing for the rest of my life, if you need to say a day at a time, fine, am I willing for the rest of my life to keep growing in understanding and effectiveness? Or do I really not see the reason for it? Have I really missed something? I think 11 is absolutely fabulous for me. I think when they say prayer, they really mean prayer. And I think when they say meditation, they really say meditation. I've become a big advocate of, medica of meditation. I was going to say medication. I, I had been trying to meditate for 14 years. And it was a chore. But every day I'd get up, I became willing again to keep trying, to do the best I could do. And unbeknownst to me, right in my own backyard, we have the Tibet Museum in Staten Island. Where a Buddhist monk is meditation classes. And I started going. And I was rocketed to another dimension beyond any I've known. Make use of what spiritual people have. I think my nightly inventory is very important in step 11. No more important than waking up and asking God to direct my thinking. Let it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, a selfish motive. To think about my day ahead. To sit there in contemplation and think about my day ahead. To do exactly what it says. To think how I would like to go about my day. Loving, kind, everything that I could think of. I think step 12 is fabulous for them. I love to show them that that's part of their recovery. I've already thanked them for asking me to help them. Because without them, I'd be drunk. I need that new person. I need to help him. I love in the 12th step where it talks about on the first visit, we outlined the spiritual program of action. Wow. What a concept. Let them know what they're in for. Outline it. That's what it says to do. Or do I really start to think that this is a laddering program? that I can pick and choose and take what I want? Or can I really turn my life and my will over to the care of God and believe that God will fix it all? All I got to do is walk the path that was walked with me. Nothing more, nothing less. I think simplicity, friendship, are the keys to sponsorship. I've never told anybody, and I may tell Rob over here soon, but I've never told anybody to take the cotton out of their ears and put it in their mouth. I'm only kidding, Rob. Never told it. It tells me just to do the opposite. It tells me to listen to my new friend. I have to listen to know where he's at, to put myself in his shoes. Can you imagine I go to the hospital to visit my mother? She's dying of cancer. I say, why don't you shut the hell up, Mom? Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. Wow. That goes against everything we've been taught. It goes against love, tolerance. Do I really think that the last four chapters have nothing in it for me? Because there's really not too many directions in the last four chapters. Can I take the alcoholic through the last four chapters? Can I look and point out every spiritual belief that's in there? And I found hundreds of things that I have to do in those last four chapters. It's not laid out like a set of directions. There are many things that I have to do. Now, if I've been thorough, which I like to think I am, 
And I know God's done his job. This person is falling. And I do a lot of talking about the ego with them. All along, we talk about ego. Ego that'll stop me from doing self-examination, stop me from going to God. Like for me to go to you, you, look at you. Doesn't want me to do self-examination. Probably pretty soon he's going to start getting spiritually arrogant. He's going to think he's better than them people who just don't drink and go to meetings. You see, but he ain't better just like I'm not better. Here's the spiritual travesty again. I have divided in Alcoholics Anonymous. Rather than bring together and love my brother, I've divided and set myself apart. Worst thing I could do. Can you imagine setting myself apart from someone that suffers from the same sickness and disease that I do? I gotta love them. They're my brother. Well, I've been going on and on. This is nothing like the last talk. Funny things happen when you go in the bathroom and you ask God to please give you the words to say. And I don't know what the hell I'm rambling on about. But I do trust that my thinking has been placed on a much higher plane. And if I just help one person, if one person saw anything, it's terrific for me. I love to squash the ideas that we hear in the fellowship with the new person. I love to, I love the don't drink and go to meetings. And I don't say this in a sarcastic way or in a nasty way, but I really like to show him how he doesn't have the power not to drink. And I love to watch him experience the first step. Oh, hell, I'm screwed. I'm going to drink again. I'm dead. I love to show how it's a progressive disease of body, mind, and spirit. And if I just take care of the body, doesn't the, progressive, the progression keep going? Doesn't the mind and the spirit keep getting sicker and sicker unless they're treated? And the mind is the main problem of the alcoholic that takes them back to the drink. Drinks the craving starts. We're off again. I've worked with a lot of people who've balked. My favorite story is my friend Mikey, who was writing inventory. And he asked me if he had a ride on vacation. <laughs> I asked him if he wanted to live or die. I said, you don't have to write long on vacation. You start at 9 in the morning and you can finish at 5 in the afternoon. Well, hell, you're not working. you got to do something. Can I really make this the most important thing? Well, anyway, Michael stopped writing. And he called me up and he said, I stopped writing. And I said, how good? Can I lose my attachment to what's good and bad? Do I think it's bad because he stopped writing? You know, it's like the girl walking down the street who gets raped. And she gets pregnant. And it's horrible. And it stinks. And it's lousy. And it's bad. And 25 years late, later, that child grows up to solve world peace. Wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Do I really know what's good? Do I really know what's bad? Have I really become God and I know I have to lose my attachment to what's good or bad. Anyway, Michael came over to my house, and we sat down, and we started writing. I mean, we opened the book, and I opened it to the first page, the story of how many men and women have recovered, or hundreds of men and women have recovered, with the circle and the triangle. And he said, we did that. And I said, I know, and I kept reading. And He said, but we did all this. I said, yeah, but we missed something. You see, if I'm not following directions, I miss something. I ain't got the first requirement. My life run on my will can hardly be a success because I'm starting to decide what I should do when I should do it. So I certainly miss that. 
And I guarantee if I've missed that, I've missed something before. Do I really see how powerless I am? Do I really see how badly and desperately I need this power to live? Not just to stop working. Important that they see it. I think it's important for me to take their inventory to see if they've picked up this simple kit of spiritual tools laid at their feet. Are they using it or aren't they? Are they sticking their hand out to the newcomer? Are they doing their 10-step, their 11-step work? I was sponsoring this beautiful woman. And I asked her, uh, what are you doing to grow in understanding and effectiveness? She's a pretty powerful woman. She said, well, I'm working with people. I think she said, I'm working with seven people. I said, how many people were you working with six months ago? I don't know, same amount, maybe eight. She said, but I'm praying and meditating in the morning. I said, what were you doing six months ago? She says, I'm writing inventory. I said, what were you doing six months ago? What are you doing today to grow in understanding and effectiveness? Do I believe I don't have to grow in understanding and effectiveness? Do I believe I've reached whatever point it is and that I'm okay today? Has my ego come in? Has it grabbed me? Does it own me? I don't, I don't ever take anything away from the program, but I hear a lot. One of the things I ask the people that I sponsor to do is please inventory spiritual arrogance. Got to inventory spiritual arrogance. You got to see when you're spiritually arrogant where you harm others. And we do it four column. Inventory is an inventory. Do I just take them through the program recovery and then say goodbye? Or do I walk the journey with them? It tells me to go hand in hand. I've been given the five minute sign. I got notes that I didn't follow that came to me in uh, meditation. I like to hear from my new friends. They're part of my family. They're just like my brother, my sister, my son. These new friends are my family. I love them all. I never work with one I haven't fallen in love with, male or female. I love them. I'll do anything for their sobriety. Anything at all. Now, I know I said a lot of things, though. I got to talk about my last thing. It's called balance. Where I come from, I've been the only person to work this program of recovery. And I have been working with a person after I got off work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Usually Saturday was three, Sunday was easy, was two. And people told me, Larry, you had to find balance. You got to get balance. So I opened up my big book and I looked for balance. I didn't find balance. But what I found was if I stay close to him and perform his work well, he will provide everything I need. And I got to tell you, I was inundated with people to help. And sometimes I felt very inadequate. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I used to ask God to please remove my arrogance. Because I had seven weeks over and I sat at a meeting and this guy with 18 years was talking about the fourth step, how he did it in his mind. And when it came to me, I said, I guess you didn't do it. Because the direction says we put it down on paper. On paper. We take pen to paper. And I stood up for what I believe was the truth. And now there's so many alcoholics in Staten Island that work the program recovery, I could just sit back and smile. The ones that I love. Recently, my sponsor came back from a six-year uh, vacation. And... Uh, he told me that he doesn't think he could work with the new person anymore, like he used to do. And my heart broke, and I really wanted to cry, 
Because I love the new person. I love you. I adore you. I'll die for you if I got you. I'll walk to the ends of the earth, which I love you. He said he's just been brought to such a different place, and he doesn't know if he could ever work that simplistic anymore with them. And my answer was such a shame. He said, yeah, Larry, but who would be here for you? And I thought about it, and I understood it. wasn't too happy with it, but I understood it. And I love to look for the newcomers. And I think the last four people who I've sponsored, one has 12 years, one has 14 years, just what I was sorry for him for doing. Here God teaches me another lesson. I look for the newcomer. I don't get a brand new guy. I get someone who's been around. I get someone who's relapsed, who's coming back. I get someone who in sobriety wants to kill himself. Hits that wall. Hits the bottom. Just can't make it. I talked a lot about the spiritual realm being all-inclusive, never exclusive, never dividing. And I have found there are differences in working with men and women. And I mean this very sincerely. They are differences, but the work is identical. A lot of the differences are on page 52 of the medievalness. I'll pray to my emotions, my feelings. I found that women do have a harder time to realizing how they feel is of no consequences to their actions they take. To grab God's hand and say, come on, God. Let me be kind, loving, caring, giving, even though I feel miserable. And I also found there's another difference. I found in relationships there's a big difference. And, and, and I kind of found this guide. It's a five-step guide for women in relationships. And it goes something like this. Number one. It is important to find a man who works around the house, who cooks, cleans, and has a job. Number two, it is important to find the man who makes you laugh. Number three, it is important to find a man who's dependable and does not lie. Number four, it is important to find a man who is good in bed and likes to have sex with you. Number five, it is important that these four men never meet. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.